remembering, I'm going to start recording um, before everybody starts speaking. So I will turn it over to uh, my colleague, Suzanne Rumsey to introduce our first speaker. Thanks, Kim, and welcome everyone. I'm um, going to introduce Patricia um, Ruzchuk, who is uh, one of the newest uh, staff members at PWRDF. And uh, Patricia has joined us in the role of Director of Partnerships and Programs. She's worked in international development for more than 25 years, designing and implementing development and humanitarian assistance programs in partnership with people and organizations in Ukraine, Ethiopia, Uganda, Myanmar, and Palestine, to name a few. Most recently, she was the Director of Engagement and Learning at the Manitoba Council for International Cooperation, an organization of which uh, PWRDF is a member. And Patricia lives and joins us um, from Winnipeg. She lives there with her husband and two sons and dog Mojo. So I'll pass it over to Patricia. Thank you, Suzanne. Thank you for the nice introduction. And hello to everyone. And thank you for, in, for inviting me to present with you today. I am really looking forward to the, for the opportunity to talk to you about what PWRDF is doing to help people in Ukraine. And uh, none of this could be possible without the support of our supporters across the country. So it's really wonderful to have the chance to, to meet with you um, sort of in person, <laughs> virtually at least face to face. And uh, I want to say a special to hello to Kate Woodman, who is on the screen with us today, because Kate and I actually know each other from our time in Kiev. We both lived in Kiev at the same time. And um, little did we know that we'd be meeting up again under these circumstances. So hi, Kate, nice to be in contact with you again. So um, our, our, our feature speaker today is, is Hannah from Fight for Right, but uh, before we get to her and all the information that she can share with us about, about the work that their organization is doing, um, I'm going to give you just a quick little introduction and overview to what PWRDF is doing. Um, and let me just see, how can I change my slide? <laughs> um, Oh, sorry. There we go. Uh, so to start, before I start talking about our work, um, I thought maybe it might be useful to give you just a quick introduction to some of the locations in Ukraine that we're going to be talking about and a little bit um, a little bit of background and history about the context, because I know when I sort of did a practice version of this presentation for Suzanne and Kim, they said, well, you've mentioned many times about 2014 and um, what, does, what is that all about? So I will try and explain in uh, a very brief and, and uh, concise manner um, what, I'm, what, what we talk about when we talk about 2014, because as, as everybody knows uh, worldwide, February 24th, um, Russian forces invaded Ukraine. Um, but what a lot of people maybe don't realize or have forgotten is that um, this is sort of a second phase in a conflict that actually began in 2014. And as you see on the map here, um, you can see the capital city of Kiev. But this line here represents a portion of the country that has been occupied by Russian forces since 2014, as well as the Crimean Peninsula. Um, now, of course, Hana is an actual Ukrainian. So anytime I make a mistake, I'm going to ask her to correct me. But um, my understanding of what's happened since 2014 is that in 2014, Ukraine had a democratically elected president named Yanukovych, um, who in 2014 was hesitating about uh, signing on to an economic agreement with the European Union. This was an unpopular decision amongst most of the Ukrainian public and peaceful protests began um, because a lot of the population was hoping that the country would move more towards Europe than back towards Russia. And um, Yanukovych was clearly leaning towards more of a Russian alliance than a European alliance. So peaceful protests arose. As part of those protests, protests um, riot police fired on the protesters. Um, several people were killed. Uh, over a, almost 100 people were killed um, during these protests as a result of uh, the riot police fi firing on them and battles, mostly in the city of Kiev. Um, those 
people who were killed are now named the um, Heavenly 100, and there are memorials to them in the city of Kiev. And um, as a result, um, Yanukovych eventually fled to Russia and is in exile there. In sort of um, retaliation, Russian forces um, invaded the and, and annexed the Crimean Peninsula, which is this portion of the country circled here. That's been under Russian occupation since 2014. And then Russian troops moved into these eastern portions of Ukraine um, in the areas around the cities of Luhansk and Donetsk. Um, and they are they have been occupied by Russian forces since 2014. Now, you have to apologize for my very primitive drawing on this map. This is the best I can do. This is not exactly the areas that are it's not an exact representation of the areas that have been occupied since 2014, but the best I could do with uh, the tools I had. And um, I'm just going to get slightly political here, but um, I think it's important to say that I'm telling you that Russian forces invaded these two areas. Russia, Russia has denied, um, officially denied that they were um, behind these two invasions of the Crimean Peninsula and the Luhansk and Donetsk regions. But um, they will say that these are, uh, are Ukrainian separatists. Um, and I would say that that is false. Um, basically, these have been, it has been proven that these are people who have moved in, not in Russian uniforms, and Ukrainians were calling them, especially in Crimea, little green men, because they were dressed in military combat, but no Russian insignias on them anywhere, but they were using all Russian supplies and weapons, and they were Russian backed. So I have to say the one thing about this whole conflict, um, well, many things about this conflict upset me, but I really don't like to see the words Russian or um, separate Russian backed separatists because um, that gives the impression that these are Ukrainian people who want to separate. There have never been any attempts by Ukrainians to separate from the country. I would say that these are all Russian backed forces. So that's a little bit of background and history. And then we'll go on to talk a little bit about what Ukraine or what PWRDF has been doing to help Ukraine um, since the war erupted in February. Um, so we have been supporting um, six organizations in Ukraine. Um, at the beginning of the war, because the outpouring of support from, from um, Anglicans across the country was huge and we suddenly had a huge amount of funds that we needed to program, we started by um, turning to the ACT Alliance, which is um, an, an alliance that we are a part of. We're one of 140 faith-based organizations worldwide that is part of the ACT Alliance. And these are organizations that have come together as faith-based um, as faith based entities to work in development, advocacy, and humanitarian assistance. And you can see some facts about them here. Um, the ACT Alliance had an, one active member um, present in Ukraine prior to February 2020, 2014, and this was Hungarian Interchurch Aid. And Hungarian Interchurch Aid um, obviously is a Hungarian church, but they had, um, they had uh, operations in Ukraine. They had been helping people affected by um, the invasions in 2014. And so at the very beginning of this war, um, they were able to ramp up their activities and we started to support them at the, as soon as the, uh, as soon as our donations began to pour in and the conflict began in February. So Hungarian Interchurch Aid, and I'll just show you a map as to, so you can get a sense of where they're working. Of course, they are based here in, in Hungary, but they also have operations across the border in Ukraine and also in Lviv. And so they have set up since uh, February 24th, they have set up reception centers and shelters for Ukrainians who have crossed into Hungary and have claimed refuge there. And they're supplying them with places to live, food, clothing, medical supplies, and hygiene supplies. And then they've also set up and worked in partnership with Ukrainian partners in Western Ukraine in Lviv, but also here um, near the border with Hungary, where they're doing the same thing, supplying people who have fled eastern Ukraine because of the fighting, but have not chosen to leave the countries. These We're calling these people internally displaced persons, and they are helping them there um, with, again, everyday needs and, and shelter and so on. And to date, um, 
PWRDF has provided $170,000 to Hungarian interchurch aid. Um, the majority of that is funds and donations, but we also had the opportunity to apply to the Manitoba Council for International Cooperation for a matching grant that we supplied. Uh, we, we contributed $20,000 and they matched that amount with a $50,000 grant, which we also transferred to the efforts of Hungarian interchurch aid. So we're very happy to be able to leverage some of the funds that the don generous donations we're receiving from uh, Anglicans across the country with um, funding from MCIC. Another partner that we turned to at the very beginning of the conflict and sort of an international partner that we have experience with and we had already had working relationships with is Help Age Canada. They are a part of a network called Help Age International and they have been working in Ukraine since 2014, um, particularly in Eastern Ukraine. So their activities, oh, this is a map I was meant to delete some of these circles, but they, they have been working in areas such as um, in Western Ukraine or sorry, in Eastern Ukraine that have been affected from the invasion since 2014, supplying elderly people with um, medications, hygiene supplies, food, and sometimes in some severe cases, things like um, wheelbarrows of coal to help them heat their, their, um, their premises where they were living. Some were living in apartments, but some had taken refuge in places such as abandoned railway cars and were using the coal furnaces of the railway cars to heat them for their own use um, for shelter. So they have been working since 2014 in Dnipro, Donetsk, and, um, and the Kiev area. Since the war began in 2014, um, they have expanded their services, not just to uh, elderly people, but to all people fleeing the conflict and needing assistance. And they've set up um, offices in Moldova as this purple circle here. So in Moldova, they are receiving refugees. They are um, helping them again with hygiene supplies, medications, shelter and assistance, uh, food assistance, and cash assistance as well. And they're finding that the majority of, well, I think over 40% of the people crossing the border are senior citizens, as um, men between the ages of 18 and 60 are not allowed to leave Ukraine because they're required to remain for military service. So a lot of seniors are leaving with their children or grandchildren and um, requiring specific assistance when they move into Moldova. Again, there are also a lot of seniors who have chosen to stay or are unable to leave. And so they are remaining in areas um, in Eastern Ukraine. And recently, Help Age International has begun to open offices in, um, open their offices again in Dnipro, which is this city right here, and to provide services closer to the conflict zones. So we've provided, um, PWRDF has provided um, Help Age Canada with $50,000 funding since the beginning of the conflict uh, in 2022. So once we had that initial response in place through these two international partners, um, we had some time to consider and, and to examine the landscape in Ukraine. And um, we know very well that um, the Ukrainian civil society is very vibrant. There are a lot of um, excellent NGOs that have been working, non-governmental organizations and charities that have been working to support the Ukrainians in affected by the invasion since 2014 and um, you know with the war full-scale war starting in February they have really expanded their actions and sprung into actions to continue to help their fellow countrymen and so once we had that initial response um, taken care of we decided to really focus our efforts on supporting local Ukrainian organizations so since that time we have selected four Ukrainian non-governmental organizations all of which were in um, in action since 2014 and some from before that um, helping Ukrainians and so they have expertise helping Ukrainians who have been affected by conflict and we decided that um, it made a lot of sense to support their actions and follow their lead and let them tell us where the needs are for Ukrainians. So the first organization that we reached out, out to is called Initiative E+. And this lady right here is their director, um, Valentina. And she uh, has been working, again, since 2014 to provide medical supplies to Ukrainian medics, to medical centers and hospitals and all kinds of first responders who are 
helping those um, who have been injured or wounded as a result of the conflict. So um, again, they've been doing this in Eastern Ukraine um, since 2014. Um, when COVID-19 hit, they provided medical support to hospitals across the country dealing with COVID um, by providing sort of um, equipment, breathing equipment and so on for people being treated for COVID. And then in February, when the war began full scale, they ramped up their efforts and have begun again supplying uh, hospitals and medical centers and all types of types of first responders. So PWRDF has I'll just show you where they're working. So these are their locations. They're based, Valentina is based in Kiev. And um, PWRDF has supported Initiative E Plus with funds um, in the amount of $62,000 Canadian to supply um, medical supplies, tactical medical supplies for first responders. So these are things that are sort of more specific uh, medical supplies like uh, braces that can be fitted outside of um, an arm or a limb um, for very serious fractures and breaks, um, high, high density gauze and, and wound treatment kits and things like that. So we've provided them with $62,000 to supply those sorts of things to um, medical centers in these areas, Kharkiv, Mykolaiv, some of which took a very heavy um, bombardment. And they're supplying both civilian hospitals and medical um, or military medical teams. Um, there might be some question about, you know, is it right to be supporting the military? Well, I, I can just refer you to some of the feedback that Valentina got when she delivered medical supplies to a, a civilian hospital on the outskirts of Kiev. And the doctor said to her, you know, we're treating, we're mostly treating civilians, but I can tell you that 75% of them are here because of military action. Um, so it's really difficult to draw a line between supporting the military and supporting civilians. There's a lot of blur going on and people are being, you know, the, I would say the majority of people that are affected by the conflict are civilians. So um, we are following the lead of Initiative E Plus by providing them assistance in that way. In the last week, um, we've uh, agreed to provide another $50,000 in funding to supply E Plus with um, two ambulances that were purchased in Europe and transported to the Polish border. Um, they've, um, Valentina and her team have met the, the ambulances at the border and driven them into Ukraine. And they are now, um, as, as you've heard on the news, a lot of areas around Kiev have been deoccupied. And so hospitals that were working in those areas, many of them sustained incredible amounts, heavy levels of damage. And not so not just their buildings and their staff have been affected, but also their vehicles have been affected. And as of last week, Initiative E Plus had a list of 50 medical centers in Eastern Ukraine that were requiring new, any kind of vehicle, any kind of ambulance or vehicle to help them treat people who have been wounded or who just need medical treat, medical, regular medical treatment not related to the war. So we've um, provided funding to supply two of those ambulances and they're already in Ukraine. Um, after uh, Initiative E Plus, we began, we sought out um, Fight for Right, which uh, Hannah is going to tell you a lot more about, so I will just mention them briefly, but um, they are an organization uh, founded by Ukrainian people with disabilities, mostly women, as a matter of fact, and um, before the war, they were working to promote the rights of people with disabilities in Ukraine. Since the war broke out, they have been providing very specific services to people with disabilities, and Hannah will give you a lot of details about those, but they include things like um, outreach in terms of uh, hygiene products, medication, and support for people who have chosen to stay in Ukraine or cannot leave Ukraine, and then um, evacuation services for people with disabilities and their caregivers who have who need to leave the country or have decided to leave the country. And PWRDF is supporting Fight for Right um, with a grant of $65,000 Canadian. And this is being specifically used to support their 24-hour hotline where people with disabilities can contact them and request all types of support, um, food, hygiene packages, medication, or evacuation support. And Hannah will give you more details on that. So I'm going to leave those that information to her. Now, they are 
they have headquarters in Kiev. Hanna is based in Lviv, which is here in Western Ukraine, but their operations are throughout the country. And I, I'm just gonna ask her to provide more details of that when it's her turn to speak. Um, one of our latest partners is Jedalaw Children's Rehabilitation Center, which is based in Western Ukraine. Um, we just approved a grant to them for $70,000 Canadian. Jedalaw is one of um, sort of like the longest standing um, organizations that we are helping here. They actually were um, came into action in uh, or came into being in 1992 um, when a group of local parents actually phone, um, founded the center in order to provide uh, re rehabilitation services for their children with cerebral palsy. And since then, since 1992, Jetta Law has expanded its services to help children in Lviv and um, surrounding areas. Oops, and I'll just show you Lviv. They're based here in Lviv City, and they help children from the areas surrounding Lviv since 1992 with day programs and um, things like physiotherapy, um, social programs, support for their parents. Um, they also have a workshop in their building that uh, repairs wheelchairs and other um, medical supplies and adaptive supplies for children with disabilities. And since the war began in um, 20 in February, they have been working with the municipal government of Ukraine to provide shelter to internally displaced people who are fleeing uh, eastern Ukraine um, and people family with families with children with disabilities. So um, they have set up at the Lviv airport, or sorry, at the Lviv train station, they have set up a information booth where families arriving with children with disabilities can speak to them directly. They provide them with shelter, um, medications, um, things like uh, diapers for children and teens, um, shelter and support and physiotherapy for the children um, staying who, who expect to stay in Lviv. And then they also have a fleet of um, handicap accessible buses, which can transport families to the Polish border because as if they decide to leave the country. So um, they've helped um, and sheltered over uh, 400 people and families with disabilities since the start of the war in 2022. Um, and they're getting a lot of support for these activities from organizations such as UNICEF. But what they've approached us about is they said that, you know, we're happy to provide this work. It's really important. There are so many families needing this help and we're happy to provide it. But what has happened is there's been an impact on their regular clients. The families and children that they have been helping for years around in Lviv and around, um, they've had to discontinue their day programs because the center is now sheltering so many IDP families. And they are making attempts to do outreach, mobile outreach to their families, but it's been difficult. And um, another challenge for them is that the building that they are working in is uh, quite an old building. Um, it has a heating system that hasn't been updated for over 30 years and was also dependent on gas supplies. So they approached us and asked if we would fund um, the uh, replacement of their gas furnace to an electric heating system in order to make them less dependent on gas uh, on gas supplies, which are very difficult to come by right now and quite expensive, in order to have a system that is more modern and energy efficient, and which will require less maintenance and upkeep, because what they're finding is that they're getting support from UNICEF for their IDP activities, they're getting a lot of donations from the general public and internationally, but a lot of that is being taken up by um, maintenance on their heating system, which is out of date and very difficult to service and to fuel. And so um, by replacing the system to something more modern and energy efficient, they can then free up the funds for maintenance funds for programming funds for their local uh, clients. So um, this might not sound like exactly what people have in mind when they think, oh, let's donate to help Ukrainians. but I can say that um, from my experience working in in uh, organizations where we've helped organizations um, that are working with refugees and IDPs internationally, this is very common that host communities um, step up to the plate and take in IDPs and refugees and help them because they want to help their countrymen or their neighboring countrymen and they want to do things to help people who are in need. And the thing is that these conflicts often 
draw on for years or, or months. And, um, and then the host community becomes to be a little bit negatively effective, be affected because, you know, they have to drop their normal activities to help their refugee friends and, and IDP families. And um, so what we're doing here is is tending to the needs of the host community, which is giving a lot, sacrificing a lot, and contributing a lot to um, the humanitarian efforts of Ukraine. So we're really happy to be able to provide this um, flexible and unique support for Jetta Law. And finally, um, I want to introduce you to Voices of Children. This is an organization that we've recently re received a, a, a proposal for funding from. Um, they are also based in Lviv, sorry, in Western Ukraine. Um, and they are based in Lviv in Western Ukraine, and they provide psychosocial support for children who have been affected by the war. And they, um, they, the organization began again in 2014, created by a child psych Ukrainian child psychologist who wanted to provide assistance to children um, who had been affected by the invasion and the conflict in, Dohan in Luhansk and Donetsk. And um, so they've been doing that since 2014, and now since 2020 of course, they have expanded their services. Currently, they have, I believe, eight shelters in the Lviv region where they are helping IDP families to come and uh, find places to live. Often, these are families and sometimes they are also, also children who are living in orphanages or in foster or group homes. And the entire foster or group home has been shifted out of eastern Ukraine into the Lviv area. So um, these are, you know, very vulnerable children and they are providing uh, psychosocial support support through um, visits with therapists, psychologists, art therapy, different programs to help children coping with um, the violence and the conflict that they have seen. And they have approached PWRD, PWRDF to provide um, funding to the amount of about $83,000 Canadian. And what that will do is it'll allow them to send mobile psychosocial support teams to the areas around Ukraine, which are around Kiev, which have recently been deoccupied. And as you know, if you've probably been watching the news, there was a lot of um, very violent activity taking place uh, in the communities around Kiev. Uh, many children witnessed a lot of terrible things. Some have been orphaned um, or um, injured or are dealing with parents that have been severely injured. Sometimes their mothers were the victims of rape. And so um, Voices of Children will be sending mobile psychosocial support teams to provide visits to families and children living around Kiev in deoccupied zones, and PWRDF will be providing the support for that. Um, to end, this is the end of my speech and my presentation. I hope um, I haven't given you, overloaded you with too much information, but um, I have to say that we're really proud of the um, the partnerships that we've created and the um, excellent local organizations that we've connected with and have been able to, um, to support the work that they are doing and that they are driving. We feel that Ukrainians know best what is needed in their own countries and we want to support them in, in the work that they are doing. And um, I think we're going to end now and I'm, I'm very excited to hear Hannah's presentation and to hear from her directly about Fight for Rights excellent, excellent work. But uh, before I end, um, I had Sent, shared with Suzanne a video that um, our newest partner, Voices of Children, has prepared, just sort of telling a little bit, giving you a little snapshot of um, how one child from Eastern Ukraine has been affected by the conflict. And it's a very sort of personal story of his, um, but I found it really, um, really effective and I wanted to share it with you. And um, just so you know that part of the funding we'll be providing to Voices of Children will be to to create more videos telling the stories of children who have been affected like this. And um, so we'll be sharing more of these with you in the future and PWRDF will be, our logo will be at the end of them. So it might be a tool for you to share with your with your parishes or your, your friends and family. So thanks for your attention. Thanks for having me. And I look forward to answering your questions and I'll turn things over to Suzanne to get the video going. Thanks, Patricia. Just bear with me a moment, folks, and we'll get that up.
Мне успели готов принести. Папа закрыл Эльку в спальне. Она без следы писала, писала водички. Элька, это вот мама проживает. А я проживаю за Чарлика. Человек тоже кот. У нас два кота. Когда он был на улице Чарли, мы его забрали его один месяц. Один месяц. Он очень-очень ну, маленький был. Он даже синий глаза такой миленький. Он скучал по котам. That little boy's name was Mark. It's my pleasure now to introduce Hannah Zaremba Kosovic. Hannah has a PhD in sociology and is a research fellow in the Ethnology Institute of the National Academy of Sciences of Ukraine in Lviv, Ukraine. She is also an analyst in the Disability Research Center there. Hannah is currently working with the Ukrainian NGO Fight for Right, an organization established by Ukrainian women with disabilities with a core mission to promote the rights of persons with disabilities. Since the start of the war, Fight for Right has provided critical support to people with disabilities and their caregivers. Hannah lives in Lviv with her daughter and her husband, Jura, is currently with the Ukrainian army in Eastern Ukraine. Hanna, welcome. Susan, thank you for introduction. Uh, I really like your clothes. Um, can you tell me, do you hear me well? Great, it's good. Uh, thank you. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, I want to thank you uh, for supporting Ukraine in this difficult time, time of Russian-Ukrainian war. Uh, also, I, I want to thank you for the opportunity to talk about the organization I represent, NGO Fight for Right. Uh, today, uh, I will talk about emergency response for Ukrainians with disabilities during full-scale Russian invasion of Ukraine. Janice, can you uh, change the slide? Uh, it's me. Uh, I'm an analyst of uh, organization People of Disability Fight for Right. Also, I'm human rights defender. Uh, yes, next slide. Uh, Fight for Right is Ukrainian organization of people with disabilities founded and led by women with disabilities, as Patricia told before. Um, the organization was founded in uh, 2017. We are a very young organization. Uh, our core mission is implementation of the United Nations Convention uh, of the Rights of Persons with Disabilities um, in Ukraine. It, in particular, we have had um, and continue to try, uh, to, try uh, to work in such areas. Uh, firstly, networking. Um, we have the National Fight for Right Disability Defenders Network. Uh, this network uh, includes uh, 140 organizations and activists from all over Ukraine. Uh, second, um, sorry, the rights of people with disabilities in Ukraine are often violated, uh, and we at Fight for Right try to support people who have bright human uh, rights ideas for projects uh, that can have a positive impact uh, on the situation. Uh, secondly, we are fixing uh, leadership um, of the community of people with disabilities in Ukraine, especially in politics, social areas, human rights and civil uh, movements. Uh, 
for instance, we have a project Liderka. Uh, the Liderka School for Politics Participation for Girls and Women with Disabilities project was created to teach uh, women and girls with disabilities to defend their rights uh, and uh, worldviews using the tools of political participation and to motivate them to take an active part in country political and social life. Uh, graduates from the school get uh, the opportunity to do internships in public authorities uh, or in a large companies to correspond to their experiences. Uh, certainly, uh, we have um, advocacy campaigns. Um, we created Disability Research Center in uh, Fight for Right uh, and um, improving, uh, improving Ukrainian legislation and integration human rights based approach to disability with all state policies and laws. Uh, as a disability research center, we um, conduct research and prepare analytical uh, materials. Uh, namely, research uh, um, was conducted in following topics, uh, rights for people with disabilities in Ukraine, uh, alternative report on Ukrainians implementation of the Convention uh, of the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, uh, together for available elections, uh, and art for everyone, situation uh, of cultural, uh, cultural rights of persons with disabilities in Ukraine. Uh, firstly, uh, we have uh, educational uh, direction. Uh, we have created a course, uh, Protection of the Rights of People with Disabilities. Uh, the course uh, helps students with or without disabilities to try on the head of human rights defenders and gain skills in various methods um, of human rights protection, both nationally and internationally. Uh, we conduct trainings for business uh, that uh, want to develop in the direction of inclusion and human rights. Uh, we conduct corporate trainings online and offline uh, for business owners, HRs, employees uh, in different topics, for example, uh, people with disabilities in the labor market, uh, implementation uh, of inclusive policies, uh, in the companies, uh, in, uh, employment of people with disabilities, uh, access to work and work in their uh, environment. Uh, please, uh, next slide. Um, around uh, the end of January 2022, uh, we began to uh, somewhat transform our work. Uh, in the face of a possible uh, full-scale Russian invasion. Uh, we conduct a survey within our network on psycho-emotional informational uh, um, readiness uh, of, for war, uh, the level of knowledge about behavior uh, in case of uh, hostilities and the general attitude, attitudes uh, of people. Also, we have begun uh, to study national and international legislation on the treatment of civilians in emergency concerning the situation of persons with disabilities. And we uh, have scheduled meetings with, uh, with representatives uh, of the Ministry of Emergency Situation of Ukraine and Ministry of Internal Affairs of Ukraine. Uh, however, on uh, February 21st, 2022, uh, we uh, had to uh, save ourselves and very quickly uh, reorient uh, re our work and find uh, the resources uh, to do so. Uh, according to official data, uh, 2.7 million people with disabilities live in Ukraine. Uh, they face uh, too many challenges during the war. Um, for instance, uh, architectural uh, inaccessibility of shelters, uh, lack of medicine, products, hygiene and medical supplies, psychological issues, uh, also legal gaps, uh, 
um, for instance, uh, in the first weeks uh, of the war, it was not uh, entirely clear uh, which categories of men in age um, 18, 60 years uh, could cross the Ukrainian border. Uh, now these uh, cate uh, categories are clearly defined. Uh, there are 23 of them. Um, the first um, a man uh, recognized is uh, prescribed a uh, manner unfit to military service for health reasons with the exception of military registration. Second, uh, this who permanently live abroad. Uh, third, uh, they are applicants for professional higher uh, and higher education abroad. Uh, for um, authorized representatives on the monitoring group and go to monitor the condition of children stay outside Ukraine. Uh, three, uh, five uh, people with disabilities, uh, regardless of group of disability. Uh, in Ukraine, uh, there are three group of disabilities. Uh, six, uh, men who uh, accompany a person with disability and um, are the father, husband, son-in-law, or son uh, of such a person. Uh, seven, men uh, accompanying a person with a disability of group first or second, or another person in need uh, of constant care. Eight uh, caregivers uh, um, accompanying a person with disability recognized by a court uh, as uh, incapable. Uh, nine men who uh, accompany children with disabilities and are parents of such children, caregiver, uh, trustees, foster parents. Uh, Ten uh, men who uh, accompany the seri uh, seriously ill children. Uh, 11 men um, accompany orphans, children dep uh, deprived uh, of parental care. Uh, 12 uh, reserved for uh, the period of mobilization and wartime for public authorities, other state bodies, local governments, um, as well as uh, for enterprises, institutions and, uh, and organizations. Uh, 30 recognized by the military commission as uh, temporarily unfit to military service for six months. Um, 14 men supporting, uh, supporting three or more children under the age of 18. Uh, 15 men who have a minor child and wife who, are, uh, who is serving the, uh, in the military. 16 employees of military administration bodies, military uh, units, uh, subdivision, enterprises, institution, and organization of different uh, ministries of Ukraine um, and other, uh, other staff. 17 um, indeed uh, servicemen going abroad for tra uh, treatment. Um, and just last week, more categories of men uh, were added. Um, um, for, um, for example, athletes who are included in the national teams uh, of Ukraine in Olympic, non-Olympic uh, non sports and sports for persons with disabilities. Um, coaches uh, from the national teams uh, of Ukraine, which provide trainings for athletes, include in the national teams of Ukraine in Olympic, uh, non-Olympic sports and sports for people with disabilities. Um, also, uh, sport, uh, sport, uh, sports uh, judges uh, and other specialists uh, who provide in particular organizational, scientific and methodological medical support, uh, anti-doping uh, anti control, and cetera, training uh, for athletes who are included in the national teams of Ukraine in Olympic, non-Olympic sports and sports for people with disabilities. Also, there are categories uh, of drivers transporting uh, humanitarian aid. Um, the next one, trackers and passengers car carriers. And the last one, a railway man who an, uh, ensures the functioning and uh, uninterrupted operation in the railway. Yes, a long speech about uh, categories of men. Janice, can you change uh, the slide? Um, as, um, 
Okay, this one. As Patricia uh, told uh, uh, before, um, Fight for Right brought together people and uh, organization uh, worldwide uh, uh, to save lives 24 7 during a Russian invasion. Uh, we uh, created a hotline with different types uh, of help. Um, can you change uh, uh, Chinese the slide? Uh, yes, uh, since the beginning of Russian invasion, we have managed to create an international uh, initiative to help Ukrainians with disabilities. Um, uh, this uh, international network includes about 40 volunteers and experts from around the world. Um, uh, we also raise uh, financial aid to support uh, move the home part of team uh, uh, our organization to safe places. Uh, some of them live uh, now in Dania, um, Denmark, uh, and uh, uh, some part of them live in uh, Ireland. Uh, me and my colleagues stay in Ukraine, two of us. Um, can you change the slide? Um, we are uh, uniting efforts to create a mechanism uh, to support people with disabilities uh, during the Russian-Ukrainian war, which is more effective than the existing ones uh, in, uh, in United Nations. We are writing an analytical note uh, on the observing the rights of people with disabilities in context of armed aggression. You can find this note uh, in our website. Uh, also, we um, conduct um, a sociological and anthropological study of the experiences of people with disabilities during the war. Uh, exactly, uh, I uh, do this uh, research. Uh, we recorded oral history interviews with them, uh, collect different uh, artifacts, uh, photos, some things um, they, um, which they um, brought with them. Uh, when they uh, go uh, in the another place or go abroad. Um, all, we plan uh, to prepare analytical materials and create video uh, based on uh, this recording. Uh, we're gonna present this video and results in, in the end of June. Uh, next uh, slide, please. Mm. Uh, we try to work a lot with media. Um, we raise attention to the issues of situation of Ukrainians with disability during uh, the Russian-Ukrainian war in the world media and institution. Um, and um, we uh, also have um, possibility to work with Ukrainian media uh, and a lot of uh, our um, uh, participation of organization uh, and who uh, in our network uh, also have a lot of interviews with media. Um, next slide, please. Um, now we have a little bit a, a new website. Uh, we adapted uh, our site uh, to, to the new condition. You can now uh, leave a request for help uh, in our site. Uh, also, uh, there are an opportunity to donate uh, to our activities during the war. Um, currently, we have uh, 12 um, employees who work with uh, all of uh, as, uh, the, uh, all of uh, these people who need help. Um, it's a uh, 10 case managers and two operators in the hotline. Um, they are receiving and as, uh, and executing application. Uh, in the uh, from the hotline uh, and uh, this uh, 12 employees uh, in a it includes uh, one lawyer and two psychologists. Uh, next slide. Uh, what we do uh, now? Um, firstly, uh, we evacuate uh, people to safe places. Uh, 
uh, we have been able to success, uh, successfully help above, um, um, above 120, uh, uh, 100, uh, 1,200, uh, oh, sorry, <laughs> I forgot how, how to pronounce it, uh, 12, uh, 1247 Ukrainians with disabilities uh, cross the border and provide uh, critical resources to their health uh, and safety. Uh, we also provide medical evacuation uh, to 30 families with people with disabilities. And um, I, um, it's very good uh, to uh, hear about uh, this organization uh, initiative E plus uh, that they will have uh, the special um, medical uh, cars because it was very difficult to find uh, who, who can uh, bring people um, uh, with uh, very um, with disabilities uh, from the um, and not safe place to, uh, safe places to safe places or to the border. Uh, currently, um, 30, 24 people are waiting for uh, for the help. Uh, next slide, please. Um, what we do uh, next, uh, we um, assist at a uh, border crossing and with accommodation abroad, and also we provide legal um, advices uh, for people. Uh, three, uh, 378 people and their families were found housing abroad. Most of them left to, uh, for Poland, uh, Germany, and uh, Scandinavian uh, countries. We provided uh, 96 legal advice on border crossing and preparation documents for uh, European Union countries. Um, most often we provide legal advices on border crossing, including crossing the border with animals, uh, preparation of documents in the country of destination. Uh, in the next slide, um we can see um what we do uh, more um we, uh, more than um 400 people received a medicine, a medicine and medical supplies of food rehabilitation services um and also we um uh, we coordinate uh, them and uh, um, and also we have opportunity to, um, to give uh, people uh, financial assistance. Uh, and um, the last uh, help of what we provide uh, in the next slide is psychological assistance. Uh, we provided um, a 20 night uh, consultation our psychologists um, conduct both group and individual uh, consultation for people. Um, uh, and we also working uh, for, uh, on mental health uh, for our team. Um, this who work directly with people, our case managers and um, operators uh, in hotline have uh, regular meetings uh, with uh, psychologists uh, and uh, also they have have group supervision. Um, yeah. And uh, in the next slide, uh, you can see our partners who really help a lot um, for uh, our organization Fight for Right uh, during the uh, Russian invasion uh, for Ukraine. Uh, and yeah, in the next slide, you will see our contacts. Uh, you can follow us in social media. It uh, would be great. That's all. Uh, thank you for your attention. And I also waiting uh, for the question. Thank you so much, Hannah. That was a, a really helpful presentation to give us a sense of the work that you're engaged in. Um, so we're going to spend a bit of time um, with questions and conversation uh, directed either to um, to Patricia or 
or Hannah, it's helpful to, if you can, to type, type your question in the chat, just because it's hard to um, catch people raising hands. But if you know the raise hand function, you can do that too. Um, and um, yes, yeah, so just wanted to see if there are questions, observations, comments for either of our presenters. And Mary has found the raised hand function. Can you unmute Mary? I know all about that function. Anyway, um, what I, I just wanted to ask that uh, Hannah, um, if she has a personal motivation to be involved in this kind of work. And the other, the other thing I wanted to uh, just comment on was, oh my goodness, I hope if any kind of emergency like that ever happens in Canada, we have an organization like yours to fight for people with disabilities. I have a son who is very, uh, very needs a lot of help, even though he's quite bright intellectually, physically, he needs tremendous amount of help. And I'm an aging parent and I'm not gonna be around to help him. <laughs> Thanks, Mary. So a question about what brought you to this work, Hannah, what's... What's motivated Thank you, Mary, you? for the question? Um, actually, uh, my um, father um, has a disability, physical disability, and uh, my daughter uh, has ADHD. It's not disability in Ukraine, but it's difficult sometimes with, uh, with this uh, diagnosis. Uh, and uh, I doing um, my research um, about intellect, uh, uh, about people with intellectual uh, disability in a Ukrainian society. And uh, I have a lot of friends with intellectual disability. Mm -hmm. And um, it's really motivate me to help them in this difficult time. Thank you. Thank you for all you do. Thank you for supporting. It's uh, very important for us to know that people from uh, all work with us now. Thanks, Hannah. And thanks for your question, Mary. Other questions, comments? Here's one from our colleague Naba. Um, many thanks for your insightful presentation. Appreciate if you could elaborate a bit on the following. Your organization's uh, current or future partnership with Initiative E Plus and what kinds of challenges people with disabilities face at the time of border crossing. Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, the second one, really a good one question. Um, but I will start from the first question. Uh, I want to collaborate with uh, Initiative E+, Plus <laughs> because uh, they really uh, do a good work. I think uh, if you can uh, introduce uh, our, um, them for us and uh, ask for them, it would be great to have a um, cooperation. Um, and um, about second question, uh, now it's not a big problem to cross the border because uh, they are not a big line. Uh, but uh, I evacuate people uh, in the end of February and uh, in also um, in March. And it was really difficult because um, I have a great people to the Polish uh, border because uh, Liv, uh, as you see in the map, Lviv uh, really close to the Polish border. And um, I will uh, evacuate a few people to the border when the line was 20 or 25 kilometers and people stay there like a few days. Uh, it was cold because it was winter uh, and um, local people prepare food and um, some hot uh, drinks for people. Uh, it, uh, uh, it was really helpful for them, uh, but it was difficult how to go to toilet uh, um, and uh, it's difficult to stay in the car a lot of time. Some people just go by foot to the border, this 20 kilometers, uh, because um, 
it more easy to go um, uh, in the uh, I don't know how to explain uh, it's different lines uh, exactly in the border for buses for car private cars and uh, only for persons without any transports and it was uh, more easy to go with any transports but you need to go 20 kilometers and um, um, my uh, friend uh, he, uh, she um, use a wheelchair it was difficult how to go um is this 20 kilometers he changed a few cars uh, and yeah but it was a general line uh, all people uh, go in the uh, one line uh, in the border like little children people with disabilities um, no from the, uh, uh, nobody from them uh, uh, had um, priority in the borderline. And you, you were mentioning, I think, Hannah, earlier that um, some people with disabilities were being, or men particularly, initially were being turned back because the understanding of exemptions was not was not clear. Is that correct? Um, uh, I, um, it's better to say that uh, men who have invisible disability um, disabilities um, uh, had some problems in the border. Also, um, um, the men from our network um had uh, invisible disability and uh, he um, go to the military service one more time for medical commission uh, and uh, try to prepare all documents for a few days but now uh, he uh, he's in, uh, abroad after this uh, second medical commission everything uh, was good thank you Question for Patricia um, from Kate. Uh, what more can parishes do to support and expand the work? Um, thank you, Kate. I mean, I guess there are probably a couple of things. I, I, I'm always impressed when I hear, just before we started today, uh, the lady from either Vancouver or Victoria was talking about the um, events that, that her parish did where people either knitted or walked or ran um, intentionally to support Ukraine and are gathering donations that way. I'm, I'm really impressed. Uh, I know Kate, your parish is doing um, uh, sort of an evening where you're going to be talking about the situation in Ukraine, raising awareness. I mean, I think that those things are very important because um, as many of you may have noticed, Ukraine is still in the news, but not to the same degree that it was before. Um, there's always a news cycle with these events, with these crises. They are hot news, top of mind. Anderson Cooper is reporting from Lviv. He's not there anymore. Um, and so it's, you know, at this phase in a crisis, it's always helpful to try and keep uh, information in front of people to let people know that you know, individuals, civilians are still suffering, still being impacted and still need help. Um, so those informational pieces are really important. And to be very honest, um, you know, donations are always very helpful because I hope that um, you've been able to see the quality of the partners that we are that we are working with in Ukraine and we want to support them further. And we have plans to support maybe one more organization that focuses specifically on domestic violence and how that impacts women. And um, so, you know, the more that we can provide to them in terms of financial support, the better. And um, so we're always grateful for donations and of those type. Patricia, um, when we were planning this, you were mentioning a bit about um, we're really in crisis mode right now, but the, the mm -hmm. hope is that we will move into um, rebuilding, Re reconstruction. Rebuilding. Do you want to just say a bit about some think initial thinking around that? Right. This is, uh, so this is my, my dream <laughs> that um, for PWRDF and our Ukrainian partners is that what we've tried to do is create um, a bit of a coalition. We're, we're in the 
in the partnership building phase. We're getting to know these organizations, supporting their humanitarian responses right now. But we hope that this war will end soon and that we know that there will be a long rebuilding phase for Ukraine, <clears throat> which we believe the government of Canada will be supportive of, along with many other organizations around the world and governments around the world. And what we'd like to do is um, to uh, bring this coalition of local Ukrainian organizations who were active and working for their fellow countrymen, you know, way before 2022 and will continue to be there way after 2022 and go with them to approach Global Affairs Canada through the Government of Canada for funding as a coalition of local organizations. Um, localization is something that Glo Global Affairs Canada talks about a lot, that they feel it's important to work with local partners, let them take the lead. And we're really trying to walk that talk and, and put our money where our mouth is on that. And so our goal is to maybe to get some uh, leverage, some support from the Government of Canada in the future. And I can say that at least one of the partners that we've worked with has commented to us, commented to us and said, you know, that they really appreciate the fact that PWRDF is helping them to access funding because they said, you know, it's so easy for big, big organizations, international organizations to come in and soak up all the funds that are available. And here's us locals that again, have been here for years, will be here for years, and it's hard for us to get that attention and to get that funding. Thanks, Patricia, that's really helpful. Um, this is a question um, directed to Hannah, but um, others might um, have a thought about it too. Um, Andrew mentions that we are supporting a Ukrainian family in Dartmouth, which is in Nova Scotia, Hannah, which is our East Coast with uh, a 13 year old girl with Down syndrome. What kind, kind of services would be best for her in Canada that would be compatible with her Ukrainian experience? Realizing that you uh, know a lot about Ukraine but not so much about Canada. Any thoughts from you about that? I guess uh, in Canada is a better inclusion system, education, educational inclusion systems and in Ukraine. Um, it would be better to include uh, this goal to educational system, first of all, uh, and to work with socialization with children with the same ages. Yeah, uh, actually we, uh, we have this inclusion program in Ukraine, but um, our um, educational uh, system change uh, just a few years ago, uh, we have um, um, class, uh, classes or, or inclusion uh, classes uh, and try uh, to close uh, special schools in Ukraine. Actually, um, children with Down syndromes um, uh, educated in special schools. Now we have two kinds. So you can uh, bring a, a, a child with intellectual disability in special schools or go to like ordinary um, ordinary school uh, school, but uh, in uh, with inclusion. But it's uh, the second one is. I think uh, is the, uh, the the first thing uh, is uh, to to include is this goal to educational system. Thanks, Hannah. I, I noticed, Andrew, you've mentioned that she is already in school and has a teaching assistant. Did you want to just say a little bit more about that? And then unmute and just... Maybe not. Oh. Okay. There. How's that? There. We got you. Okay. Okay. Sorry. Too much technology. I know. <laughs> Um, so anyway, uh, yeah, no, so this is a family of five, uh, uh, mother, father, um, uh, uh, a daughter um, who is 18, a son and 15, and then the youngest is um, Indira, who is uh, 13 and um, is, um, and I've only, I've only met them in person once, although I've been exchanging messages back and forth with the father quite a bit. Um, and uh, like I said, she is um, in regular school with a teaching assistant. Um, she's not very verbal. 
Um, uh, at least she wasn't when I was there, but that's just because I'm a stranger, so she might not, not be. But apparently she participates in family decision making about things. So, uh, um, uh, you know, I think some possibilities there for her. Um, and we're right now just trying to find them a place to live <laughs> that is affordable, which in our vacancy rate in Halifax is less than 1%. Um, and so it's very challenging to find um, suitable accommodation yeah. for them. And yeah. I think that's, so, a, that's a challenge right across the country um, for U Ukrainians as, as well as other refugees. <laughs> is the housing yeah, situation, yeah. but it sounds like um, the first uh, good first step of, of having her in school with a teaching assistant. Um, yep, yep. So, yeah, I, so, so far, so far, that seems to be good. And the two older children yeah. seem to have um, adapted to school quite well. And their mm -hmm. English is, is actually quite, quite, quite good. Um, okay. So I, I don't think they've had a much of a problem of becoming uh, she is in a class with special needs teacher. That I don't know. Um, well, I know that she's been assigned a teaching assistant, but I don't know the qualifications of the, okay. the teacher uh, she has. I expect, not that familiar with how the, the education system for special needs children is in, mm. in, um, in Nova Scotia, except that I have a nephew who has cerebral palsy uh, and he was always part of a regular class yeah. with the teaching assistant. I don't know whether the teacher had any special training right. in, in special needs. Okay. Well, and it's the end of the school year. So hopefully come September, things can, in you know, between now and then can really get um, solidified. I think I'll, I'll just move on to the next question, which is actually one from Patricia to Hannah. <laughs> um, I know that Fight for Right does work with our partner, Jitaloa. Could you tell us about the way you work together? You had mentioned some of that networking that happens with organizations that working with uh, people with disabilities. Yes, uh, we, uh, we collaborate with uh, Jarlo a little. Um, the question of medical supplies, uh, they really help us uh, with uh, wheelchairs uh, because we have, um, a few uh, application uh, for this, and they uh, prepare um, uh, the special active, not uh, active wheelchairs, uh, and uh, we usually uh, keep in touch uh, for this. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. And um, another question from Kate, um, uh, and this maybe to Patricia, I think, but do you know what kinds of supports churches uh, may be needing? Um, that's not something that I have a lot of knowledge on. I, I don't know if Hannah has any information about that. I mean, in Eastern Ukraine, it's primarily Orthodox churches. In Western Ukraine, it's primarily Catholic churches. Um, I know that the Catholic Church in Western Ukraine is working a lot through organizations like Caritas to provide support. Um, I'm not sure. I haven't heard much about the Orthodox Church and what they're doing. Um, I don't know, Hannah, if that's something you know about. Uh I know that uh, Greek uh, Catholic churches uh, work with uh, organization of people with disabilities. Uh, I'm a volunteer in uh, organization Elarsh um, in Canada also, uh, Elarsh, uh, and uh, they help a lot uh, for this organization. And also we have another one, um, it's um, Light, uh, I forgot uh, the name, but it's really um, like uh, really close to Lars. Uh, this is another organization, but they cooperate together. Uh, and um, uh, Greek Catholics uh, Church help them. Uh, they, they mentored uh, people from this organization. But uh, it's about Western Ukraine. I don't know because, uh, as Patricia told, in the center and the east of Ukraine, uh, most uh, mostly Orthodox churches. And I don't know about uh, polit their politics of uh, helping. 
And I think you mentioned, Patricia, at the very beginning that our way in through um, church-based organizations often is the ACT Alliance, mm -hmm. um, of which, am I correct, there are no Ukrainian members, the only Hungarian interchurch aid? Right. Um, <clears throat> IOCC, which is the international organization, or I think it's, it's, it's the International Orthodox Christian, I don't remember what the acronym stands for, but it is an Orthodox organization. They have headquarters in the US. They are a member. I know that they were um, working to, I believe that they are starting operations to help people in, I don't know if they're working in Ukraine or just in surrounding countries. Um, I see there's some a comment. Mm -hmm. It's a little bit complicated with the Orthodox Church because mm -hmm. um, there are the Russian Orthodox Church. Um, there's a lot of politics there. <laughs> and um, so, uh, you know, there's some very strong, the, now I know the bishop's name or the metropolitan's name is Kirill, who has super strong ties to Putin, um, is also very likely a former, well, he is a K former KGB agent and mm. once a KGB agent, always a KGB agent. So, um, there's, there's a, it's very complicated. <laughs> um, and uh, so I, I don't know all of the details there. And I see Naba has shared its International Orthodox Christian um, Charities. And I, I'm not sure of their details uh, in terms of what they're doing right now. But um, I, I, I can say that they haven't been very visible, um, at least not in the circles that I'm working in. So. Okay, thank you. Um, just, uh, we've just got a few more minutes and I don't want to miss um, any comments or questions that came up in the chat. David uh, Townsend mentioned that as a disabled person, I'm delighted that PWRDF is helping in this way. So um, kudos from David. And, uh, oh, from Chris, a question to Hannah. And Mary, I see your hand up, so we'll, we'll get to that too. Um, Chris asking, is accessibility to shelters, um, bomb shelters, other sorts of shelters, a common or major problem and how is it being dealt with? I think you had mentioned that in your um, presentation briefly. Yeah, it, it is a big problem, uh, but Jarlo um, has accessible shelter and also they help us with one family as a housing um, them um, uh, in Jarlo. And uh, as I know, one mother of a disabled uh, child uh, in Lviv created uh, on, um, uh, in March an um, accessible shelter in the um, first floor flat uh, in Lviv. And uh, yes, yeah, they have a ha housing uh, people with disabilities, but it's private uh, initiative. And say I know Jetta Law has sorry. We try to monitor um, um, the accessibility of shelters uh, in uh, the start of the year before the Russian in, uh, invasion, but um, we, we couldn't do it. I was going to mention that Jetta Law has mentioned to us in some of their uh, reporting or the things that they've shared with us that some of their volunteers, one of their duties is is literally carrying people up and down to uh, shelters when sirens are going off um, in other parts of the country. I, I know I've read reports of people with disabilities who, because they cannot go downstairs, cannot take the elevators during air raid sirens, um, they have to stay in place. They move into the hallways of their buildings or their apartments because they have no choice. So. Thank you. Patricia, and um, I think just to give people a sense, um, when we were preparing this, Hannah explained to us that if a siren went off during the presentation, she would have to move into her hallway. Um, so this is a this is a reality that um, our partners are facing um, all the time. Um, Mary and then Shireen. Okay, I just had this to add about uh, the churches. Uh, very at the beginning of the invasion. Uh, we were asked to pray for the whole Christian church in Ukraine, and especially for the small Anglican congregation of Christ Church in Kyiv. I thought people might be interested in that. Thank you for that, Mary. Good to hear. And Shireen. 
First of all, I would like to thank you, Hannah, for being so brave and continuing to do what you're doing there. And we are all praying for you. And our church did this pilgrimage for peace for Ukraine. You know, just want to show you this. Uh, this is the power that we had for the whole week. We intentionally prayed and raised money for it. So, you know, our, all of us are behind you for what you're doing and especially i'm so touched uh, with the, what you're doing with people with disabilities i have worked with kids for seven years of with disabilities so i know exactly what you're saying and thank you so much and know that our prayers are lifted for each one of you there thank you thank you for your supporting and prayers it's very important to for us. Thank you, Shireen. And um, Chris Miller adds uh, excellent presentations, very eye-opening. Um, I think, Kim, just to check with you, um, we're pretty much to, almost to the end of our time. Um, yep. Is there anything else that needs to be said before we close in prayer? No, just uh, thank you to everybody for coming. Thank you to Hannah and to Patricia for your uh, wonderful presentations. And uh, we will make this uh, recording available to anybody who's registered. So if uh, you have friends that want to share it with or others in your parish, you can certainly uh, send along the recording when you receive it. So thank you for all of this. And we will shall end in prayer. All right. So let us pray. We lift before God, Hannah, her husband, Yura, and their daughter. We pray for ACT Alliance member, Hungarian Interchurch Aid, for Help Age Canada, Initiative E+, the Jedaloa Center, Fight for Right, Voices of Children, and all those civil society organizations, both inside and outside Ukraine, who are seeking healing and peace. And we offer this prayer written by Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin Welby, and Archbishop of York, Stephen Cottrell. God of peace and justice, we pray for the people of Ukraine today. We pray for peace and the laying down of weapons. We pray for all those who fear for tomorrow, that your spirit of comfort would draw near to them. We pray for those with power over war and peace, for wisdom, discernment, and compassion to guide their decisions. Above all, we pray for all your precious children at risk and in fear, that you would hold and protect them. We pray in the name of Jesus, the Prince of Peace. Amen.